request for refugees and rights of uh, So I think we'll get started with open space. Koto and a uh, big thanks to uh, everyone who organised this particular gig and a big thanks to all you guys for turning out. It's awesome to see so many young people interested in politics. Um, so the Opportunities Party, you guys may not have uh, heard of us. We were started back in November by a chap called Gareth Morgan and uh, we're now protesting the general election. And the whole idea of the Opportunities Party is that we want not, we're not stuck with any particular dogma. We're not left wing, we're not right wing, we just want what works. And when you look at what works, actually, looking at all of the evidence from around the world, the, the work that's done here in New Zealand and internationally, what works is a society that gives everyone equality of opportunity, a fair go. And it's pretty clear that that is not the case in New Zealand right now. The deck is stacked. The game is rigged against young people and in favour of the older generations. Housing tax loopholes, environmental degradation, inequality, all of these problems are deeply embedded in our society. And they also show up in things like really high housing and land prices, which means that you guys can't even benefit from the loopholes and uh, environmental degradation that previous generations have benefited from. So that not only do you have to pay more to get on the ladder, but you're going to have to pay again to sort out all the problems left by previous generations. The Opportunities Party wants to see real action on housing inequality, environmental degradation, starting right now. We want policies that will actually work. Now the thing is, these other guys are all going to say exactly the same stuff. <laughs> because they're trained politicians. <laughs> Not so much on the kids, fair enough. They're all going to say the same stuff, but the fact is that they haven't got the guts to introduce policies that are actually going to work because the older generations will get hit by it, and those are the people that actually vote for these guys. Our policies work for you guys, and if you don't believe us, you'll see in uh, September 23rd, because if you don't vote for us, all the people aren't going to and we won't get in. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bottom line, right? We're rolling the dice here, we're making a pretty big gamble, and we're offering policies that will actually benefit younger generations. So let's see if you guys respond and actually vote on September 23rd. Kia ora kato. I'm not a seasoned politician like uh, my colleagues here, so I have prepared a, a paper to read off. So please uh, don't, don't think less of me. Uh, my name is Guy Allen de Margotta, and I'm standing as a candidate for Wellington Central because I believe what's good for refugee and migrant communities is good for all workers in Aotearoa. Migrants and refugees need high quality, affordable housing, a living wage, and the right to organize with other workers for improved conditions. These policies benefit the majority of workers in New Zealand, regardless of national or ethnic origin. Migrants and refugees bring a net benefit to the economy, but they are scapegoated and kept down and marginalized by racist immigration and employment policies. My family were Sri Lankan migrants who fled war and political strife in Sri Lanka, and growing up in New Zealand as a young child, I saw through them the deep psychological scars that come from war and dislocation, and it gave me a great sense of uh, human rights and social justice. And I currently work as a trade unionist, I'm a trade union lawyer, and I have uh, first-hand insight uh, not only into the appalling way in which uh, migrant workers are treated, but also the way in which 
workers can unite with each other to fight against injustice. So blaming migrants and refugees for economic problems uh, deflects blame from a system of growing inequality, uh, which forces workers to compete for scraps with each other. And only solidarity between all workers can undermine the logic of competition and improve conditions for everyone. So by standing, I hope to challenge the use of migrants and refugees as a political football, which is the increasing trend uh, in New Zealand and globally. And I hope to start a conversation about the importance of migrant and refugee rights. And I want to say what's good for migrants and refugees is good for everyone. And I don't have a lot of um, career aspirations uh, to sort of um, have a great political career. I just want to overthrow capitalism. So, <laughs> Well, I'm Nicola Willis, and I've got two surprises for you. First is, I don't want to overthrow capitalism. <laughs> uh, the second surprise is, I am female candidate tonight, so represent. Um, Hey, look, I went to Vic Uni, I graduated from this university with a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature. So, you don't have to imagine too hard uh, what kind of a person I was at university. I was a dreamer, and I wasn't quite sure what my future looked like. And I imagine looking out into the room tonight, um, a lot of you guys don't know what your future looks like either. You know, you are studying something that you believe in, you are working hard, but what you do believe is that your future should be better than your today. And that is something that is a fundamental value for me, that we should all be trying to make this country a better place tomorrow than it is today. For you, and for my kids, and for all of us. And, and that is why I find myself in politics. So, to give you the whistle-stop tour, once I graduated from university through happenstance and circumstance, and it's a great story and I'll tell you at the pub one day, I ended up working for Bill English, and when I sat down with Bill English, he said to me on my first day at work, look, Nicola, I just got deposed as the National Party leader. Frankly, this caucus has lost faith in me. But you know what? Politics isn't about individuals going out and becoming things and getting titles by their name. It's about what you can do for other people. And I passionately believe that this country at the moment is the best country to be in in the world. This is a better place to be than Trump's America, than May's Britain, than just about anywhere else in the world right now. And the reason for that is we are growing. Now, I know when I was even on campus, people thought that economic growth wasn't necessarily something that was that cool. Well, it is cool. Because what it means is that right now, 10,000 jobs are being created a month in this country. And you can say to someone, I'll increase your benefit, but do you know what they want even more? They want a job and they want the ability to better themselves and their circumstances. And so what National has focused on is managing our economy so that we can offer people opportunities, we can offer them jobs. And we have done that by being resolutely disciplined about where we invest, because it's not my money, it's not grants money, it's your money, it's the taxes that you pay when you work part time. So we have focused on managing the economy well, and in doing that, we've remained out and facing. Because unlike a few of the parties up here, we've been unequivocal. We want this to be a globally trading, outward-facing country where diversity is celebrated. Now, I've taken my two minutes, but I'll leave you with this. I'm a mother of four kids, and when I stand here promoting politics tonight, I could be at home with them looking after them, and that's a really important job to do. But I'm here because I want this country to be a great place for them to live in, and you will be the people that shape that future. So you better believe 100% that when I get up here and I promote something, I'm promoting something that I think backs you to deliver a better future for this country. Thank you. I'm Grant Robertson, the Labour MP for Wellington Central. I'm so pleased to see you all here. I thought it was just going to be party political hacks. Um, <laughs> in fact, there aren't this many party political hacks at Victoria University, so I'm um, really glad to see you here. Look, there's a massive choice facing you and every other New Zealand voter at this election. It's whether or not we choose a path where we make New Zealand the country where everybody gets the chance to achieve their potential. That it doesn't matter where you come from, 
It doesn't matter how big your parents' bank balance is. You can be exactly the person that you want to be. And right now, we aren't that country. And Nicholas said before, you know, we've got economic growth. Terrific, we do. What does economic growth mean if there are kids growing up in cars and garages? If there's an 11-year-old girl tonight doing her homework in the back of a van by torchlight, how good's that economic growth for you? How good's economic growth for you when hospitals around New Zealand are putting up the house full sign saying we can't take you, we can't get you in here? How good is it for economic growth for the kids up at Karori West Dormal School to be in a school that's at 137% of its capacity? How's that economic growth working out for those people? So yes, we've got to grow the economy. It's important. We've got to generate good jobs. But we've got to give everybody a fair go and a fair share. And that's what the Labour Party is about. It's our historic mission from 100 years ago that every New Zealander deserves respect, dignity, security, and the hope for a better future. That's what our policies are about. So that's why you'll hear us talk all through the election about affordable housing and about approving the rights of renters, about making sure that we end homelessness. That's why you'll hear us talk about three years free education and making sure that our schools are properly funded. That's why we're going to put billions of dollars into health so it's cheaper to go to the doctor because every single person in this country deserves the dignity of knowing that we respect their contribution, we value who they are. That's why I want you to give your party vote for Labour. government for if not to solve the great challenges of our time. And I believe that we are suffering a, a prolonged period of grey managerialism and tinkering around the edges and a timidity to actually take on the great challenges of our time. So I've got three commitments that I'm going to make to you on behalf of the Green Party tonight. The first is that in government the Green Party will take real action on climate change. So we have the fifth highest emissions in the OECD. Uh, New Zealand is a small player, but one, if you added up all the small players in the world, we would together equal 23% of global emissions, which is almost as much as China and way more than the United States. So being small does not absolve us of responsibility. And there is an economic revolution occurring in sustainable agriculture, in renewable energy, uh, and in clean transport, and that revolution is passing us by. We are missing our window of opportunity and other countries are taking it. And so we are committed to actually doing what it takes to creating a carbon neutral economy by the year 2050. The second commitment that I'm going to make is that we will, in government, restore and replenish our forests and our birds and our rivers, which are in a parlous state. 30% of our native bird species are at risk of extinction and our rivers and our lakes are in our aquifers are in a parlous state and have gotten worse over the course of the last 20 years. We're going to clean them up when we get into, in, into government. No other political party is going to put protecting the environment at the top of the political agenda and we are going to do that. And my third commitment uh, to you tonight is that we are actually going to have a serious crack at ending poverty in New Zealand. We're actually going to try and end poverty in this country. It is unacceptable that we can be in a period of time where the economy is growing and for about two-thirds of people their real wages are increasing and so on. And as Grant said, that at the same time we have people living in cars and garages and increasing numbers. And we have a dire welfare and income support system. It traps people in poverty and it treats them like criminals. We're going to give it the biggest overhaul it's seen in 30 years and aim to lift 212,000 children above the poverty line, above the, above the poverty line and into greater opportunity. Now those are bold commitments. I get that. But that is what government for. That is why I'm standing for the Green Party. That is why I'm going to ask you to give your party vote for the Green Party, because we're aiming to do all of those things in government. Also, we've got Chloe Swarbrick. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet 
So uh, now we're going to move on to the, the question time. Um, um, political members, political society members of our, our group kind of sent in lots of questions and we went through and we chose what we thought filtered and chose what we thought were the best for kind of students and also kind of around the lines of central area. So uh, we'll start, start here. Um, Jeff, um, the, the education policy that the Opportunity Party has set out has focused on early childhood education or promised to conduct a tertiary centre review on the university side. What are your current plans to help students and universities in the Alliance and Central? How long have I got? Uh, you have four minutes. Four minutes? Oh, that's ages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, plans to help what, uh, universities in Alliance and Central. First, I've got to make a comment about early childhood education. Because, again, we come back to what's important. You get a lot of promises to help universities from different parties. And unfortunately, all the evidence shows that that is middle class welfare. Look around. Like seriously, look around at this room right now. This is not representative of New Zealand. You guys are not representative of New Zealand. We are the better off portion of society. It's difficult to admit, but it's the truth. And when studies have been done overseas of the best way to improve the representation uh, in universities, it's not by making it free. It's not by paying off all the student loans and allowances and all that sort of stuff that you hear. It's actually by providing free, full-time, early childhood education. Because we have kids turning up to school two years behind, age five. Two years behind at the age of five. And they never make that up. Now, if you're 17 with an effective age of 15, what chance have you got to getting into university? Zero. That is the key educational problem that we have in New Zealand, and funding early childhood education is the way to fix that. Now, coming to tertiary education, first up, you may have noticed that yesterday we announced our uh, continuation of our flagship unconditional basic income policy. We've already announced an unconditional basic income for over 65s and for parents with children under three of 200 bucks a week because, again, it's in those first five years that we really need to invest in young people uh, because that is what makes all the difference for their, for, their life, you know, for, for their life ahead. So overcoming poverty in that group is really the key. But yesterday we announced the next stage of that, which is... $200 a week, no strings attached for everyone of the age of 18 to 23. Well, don't clap with me. <laughs> <laughs> so if everyone between 18 and 23 will get $10,000 a year, no questions asked. Now it doesn't matter if you go to university. It doesn't matter if you go to politics. It doesn't matter if you're working or if you are unemployed. It doesn't matter if you're the 22,000 people who are not in education, employment or training and are currently not getting a benefit. There's 22,000 people between the ages of 18 to 23 that are falling through the cracks of society. They will get the unconditional basic income. Okay? We have some of the highest rates of young people, uh, you know, not in employment, education and training, around about six, one in six young people are not in employment, education and training, and we have some of the highest rates of youth suicide in the world. So we think this is an important group to give an unconditional basic income to. Doesn't matter what you do, you don't lose it, so there's a good incentive to, to, to work and apply yourself in any way you see fit. Now, that might be going to university, but it might not. Who has friends at where? I've got friends at Weta. I've got a whole bunch of friends at Weta and none of them went to formal education. They all got their jobs at Weta. Good, well paid, highly skilled jobs. They got their jobs by turning up at Weta and saying, can I copy what you do? And that's how they learn, on the job. So we at the Opportunities Party don't profess to know what the, what the jobs are of tomorrow, what the skills will be needed for tomorrow. We want to leave that entirely up to you. Disruption is coming into the tertiary sector. The tertiary sector is, is going to have to ch cope with a world where people will be constantly in and out of work, constantly needing retraining, and we will need to reshape the tertiary sector on that basis. So we think 
big change is headed and an unconditional basic income is one of the big steps that we'll need to get there to help people retrain in any way they, need, they see fit. Because people, the robots are coming. <laughs> So now we're going to go the open, open discussion on that question itself and uh, the, the comments made. Uh, yeah, just, just, yeah, uh, four minutes. Oh, so we, we all get four minutes. Yeah, oh, no, you, you get four minutes total. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, so, look, yeah, education in four minutes. Uh, the, where she had started was really important. Early childhood education is absolutely essential for every New Zealander, and if in the first five years of your life have a massive chance of determining how your life will turn out. So that's why we have to have every child in quality early child education. We made an announcement the other day that we're going to restore um, the 100% qualified staff in early childhood centre because I don't want to go um, to a doctor or uh, to a doctor's surgery and find out that only 80% of the doctors are qualified. You wouldn't want to do that. I don't want to do that when you go into early childhood education either. It's education and it needs to be respected in that way. We're going to flow all the way through making sure that our schools are properly funded and we're going to put a massive injection of money into that. Uh, we also need to make sure that those schools are getting ready for the future that Jeff talked about. I'm not sure the robots are right outside the door, but actually there is a huge change coming. And a, a small but really important policy that we're putting forward at this election is a big revamp of careers, guidance and advice in secondary schools so that it's provided professionally and so that every student gets a career plan as they go through. Because the 90,000 16 to 24 year olds who aren't in work education or training are being let down by us because there isn't a good plan and there aren't apprenticeships and there aren't opportunities for them to go to in the future. And then yet, in the tertiary sector, I've already said it, we're going for three years free. We've got some announcements around allowances and loans that will be coming up in the election campaign. I can say this tonight, $178.81 is not enough for the bond of win. I get it, I understand it, we'll do something about it. In terms of the tertiary system as a whole, we as a small country in New Zealand have a ridiculous level of competition among our tertiary institutions. We need to see a whole lot more collaboration so that we are ready for the changing world of work. We do have a system that's flexible and that's quality. This is why we're not doing tax cuts, because we need to invest that money in education.
regional council will make sure that you have subsidised fares. I think that is something that is very important here in Wellington. So that's what's in it for you. But what is in it for everyone else? Because this is going to be a theme tonight and a theme in this election. And I will not allow this debate to be reduced to Labour and the Greens care more because they'll spend more. Because you know what? If it was about spending more, guys, we would already be there and there wouldn't be any children who are missing out in this country because we have invested more and more under Helen Clark, or Grant was advising her, we did it, under John King, under Bill English, we're doing it. But it takes more than that because if you are in a family that is really, really challenged, and has had generations of welfare dependency, you need to invest in really smart ways. And so we are backing something called the social investment approach. This is where I get about as wonky as Jess has been. But the social investment approach is about saying, let's look at the interventions that really work to transform people's lives, and let's use the data. Don't be afraid of the data. These guys are really afraid of the data. To invest in the things that make a difference. And an example of that is teen parent units. Where if we invest in having teenage mums in a place where they have their kids right next door in an early childhood centre and they have wraparound support provided, we can make sure that that person has a life and their child has a life. And those are the sorts of initiatives we'll invest in. And we will make sure that we keep creating jobs in this country. Because you know what the number one thing is we can do for child poverty? It is make sure that mums and dads have jobs. And under this government, 60,000 children have moved from being in a household where mum and dad depended on a benefit to, move, to being in a household where mum and dad have a paid job. And I say that's a good thing. So look, it's about what's in it for you, and it's about what's in it for everyone else, but fundamentally we all need the same thing, which is we don't need more debt like these guys want. That just pumps and twists rates up. We don't need more taps. We do need more jobs, and we do need smart interventions, not just spraying the money down around. Thank you. Chris, Chris, Chris. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring you something that Chris was at uh, the start of her speech. Uh, I don't think anyone should give her twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> You know, personally, I, I believe that education uh, should be free, and it can be free. Um, and I, I think that the students uh, need, to, or need to rely on themselves. Uh, in the past, universities and students have accomplished things through, um, through their unions, through their, through their student unions. And actually, student unionism has been destroyed uh, in this country. Um, has been completely obliterated. And I think to the service of, um, of, of uh, those who benefit from um, an increasingly expensive education. So I think uh, actually what you need to do is not look so much to politicians for uh, positive change when it comes to you know, demanding rights and, and, and the things that students need, but to, uh, to organize um, the student unions once again. Cool. That's all I'm going to say. I'll just respond to a couple of questions. Uh, and as you know, um, some of you have costs that aren't fees, um, that involve things like trying to find a house, trying to eat, uh, trying to get around town, those sort of things. Uh, and those are not good. Um, and in fact, that is where a lot of students are experiencing real pain. And so we actually know that homelessness is actually affecting students as well, right? So you've got students who are dossing on each other's uh, couches, moving around different homes, trying to find a place to live because the housing crisis is so bad and because the accommodation supplement doesn't even come close to a minimum rent. Uh, and in fact, up until uh, recently, you know, it hadn't moved in 12 years. So, um, so uh, I mean, our focus is really on ensuring that students have actually got enough to live on, enough to be able to make ends meet while you're actually at university. Because you cannot study, you cannot possibly hope to get a degree uh, if you're um, moving around and living in different uh, houses and so on and so forth. And, I, and we know that a lot of the mental, stat, uh, mental health stats that are showing up for students are as a result uh, of that real squeeze that students are experiencing in terms of, the, of your living costs and the lack of housing and So that is a real focus for us. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, 
um, giving Nicola $12,000. Um, one of the things that the Green Party has committed to recently as part of our plan uh, to end poverty in New Zealand uh, is to increase the top tax rate above $150,000 to $0.40 cents in the dollar, right? Um, and that will help to cover the costs uh, and, and to recoup uh, some, some of those sort of expenses. We also intend to lower the bottom tax rate from 10.5% to 9%. So if you're earning under $150,000, then uh, you would get another $209 a year as, as a result of that, right? Regardless of any other, any other state support. But again, if you're going to make changes to the tax system, it makes more sense to do that at the bottom, where it affects people who aren't as well off, rather than people who are at the top. And the uh, current government's approach is largely been to cut them for people at the top. So our, our approach to education, uh, like I said, is to focus on, on your living costs. We want to give you free, um, off-peak, public transport in the form of the student green card because we figure if the oldies get the, gold, the oldies get the gold card you guys should be able to get to and from university especially given that you're having to live further and further out um, from work uh, and the third piece is really to fix the broken housing market because you're I mean apart, quite apart from the fact that you know you're still living in cold moulding mouldering Ara Valley flats um, that you know are kind of lethal um, something that we intend to do something about, there simply isn't enough housing at the moment. Uh, and it is causing rents to skyrocket and it's making life very difficult for you. So that's our focus on education. Um, so I, I was actually wrong. So <laughs> um, well, next time, four minutes for first person, about a minute and a half, two minutes for second person. So uh, that's all you've done. Yeah, uh, that, that's on me. Uh, so, yeah, so moving on to uh, Gail. Um, and as a candidate whose sole platform is on immigration rights, uh, are there ways in which immigration policies have been affecting students in recent years, and what would you do to reform the issue? good for everyone, and that includes students, um, what migrants and refugees need, uh, uh, the things that we all need, the basic uh, housing, um, access to opportunities, uh, affordable, cheap uh, housing. I mean, I've looked for flats recently, and, you know, I haven't looked for a flat in about six years or so, and there were queues of people trying to find a flat, and for the first time, in my life, I realized that you had to prepare a CV in order to get a flat. So there is a crisis. <laughs> this is not right. You know, housing is a is a human right. It should be it should be available uh, to everyone. And I think the important thing is, you know, um, we have to stop sort of blaming migrants and refugees for these problems. Uh, um, for example, on the housing crisis. Uh, you know, there is a political rhetoric that says that migrants and refugees cause it, um, and that this is simply not correct. Um, there are houses available, there are, there's state housing that has been closed down, um, there, um, the, the population growth, uh, predominantly in, in Auckland, where the housing crisis is most acute, is um, due to uh, natural increase, people giving birth, etc. So, um, yeah, I think as far as you know, everyone will benefit from us actually dealing with the actual issues as opposed to trying to blame the weakest and most marginalized sections of the working class for the problems that are actually caused by profiteering and um, actually caused by you know, the wealthy just getting wealthier. So, um, also, you know, migrants and refugees, many of them uh, do become students and are students. So, you know, obviously, you know, I went to university uh, in Dunedin and, you know, there are many, uh, many migrants and refugees in the student community. And again, you know, I think what's important is that we stop sort of um, looking at the people as having uh, interests that are radically different to 
just uh, it's just an ordinary working class New Zealander. Um, you know, these people are working class, overwhelmingly, and uh, they uh, they benefit from solidarity that the working class people have to show. And also, uh, New Zealanders generally will, will benefit from from pursuing the things, the basic rights, the basic needs that migrants and refugees have, and ensuring that we live in a society where uh, people aren't marginalized, where people aren't isolated in this way. Um, also, I think that there's much to be gained in terms of, um, sort of employment reform. Now, many students who come to study in New Zealand from overseas end up um, working uh, as well. And uh, they often end up um, in the most vulnerable uh, positions in the workforce. Uh, they are most isolated even from sort of like the workers' movement uh, in terms of being able to connect with um, you know, other workers and uh, organize in their unions. So I think, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, but that's definitely something that uh, the student population or a great segment of the student population will benefit from, um, actually ensuring that there is uh, decent, um, decent work conditions for, for, all, for all workers, regardless of whether or not they um, come here on a visa. You know? um, and I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's important to stress that um, you know, uh, migrants and refugees uh, are not responsible uh, personally for driving down the cost of living. It's another sort of um, argument that um, we often hear. Um, so what I have to say is uh, migrants and refugees don't choose essentially how cheaply they get paid. Uh, this is uh, something that's imposed upon them by employers but employing class. Um, and so if we actually ensure that migrants and refugees, um, if they enter the workforce on special visa requirements or any help, if they enter the workforce in any way, they get the protection and basic living dignity that all workers deserve. Um, and uh, this will prevent uh, scummy bosses from using them um, to drive down wages for everyone. And actually, uh, an economy with uh, higher wages is something we definitely need. So it's something that we are calling for, and I know it's been said that we're a single issue uh, campaign, but something we are wholeheartedly endorse is a living wage for all workers um, as a minimum wage. Cool.